pick up again where we left off uh, this morning in John's Gospel, chapter 14. Uh, did, I, um, uh, did I call, or I should say, are the verses I chose seven on, or did I start from just the text? Just the text, okay. Alrighty, then I'll just read the text, um, verses 12 through 14. This is what we're going to be looking at this evening, and we will just review briefly what we saw this morning. But Jesus says to his disciples, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Well, may the Lord bless His word to our hearing again this evening and encourage us to take advantage of this particular promise, understanding what it is, of course, the Lord is telling us that He is willing to give us. Now, again, in the context... Jesus has been comforting His disciples since He told them He was going to the Father. Remember, He said that He was going to prepare a place for them and that He would come again to bring them home. This was an encouragement to them that they would see heaven. They were safe. And, of course, that's very important uh, when you're setting out to serve the Lord to know that your soul is safe before you try to go and Uh, bring others to faith in Christ. Sometimes we get paralyzed just wondering whether or not we belong to Jesus. In the case of the disciples, he was telling them, there is a place for you in heaven. I am going to come and receive you again. Now, he he reminded them also how they were to get there. He was the way. They simply needed to continue to trust in him, that he had told them the truth, that he did, in fact, have the ability to give them eternal life, and he alone did through faith in his name. The fact that they were trusting Jesus is how they could know that he would come and receive them again and bring them to heaven. And he also told them more about the Father. That's what we were looking at this morning because Jesus said, I'm going to come back again and I'm going to take you and bring you into my Father's house. It's basically drawing on that imagery of the Jewish husband going to get his wife from, uh, in this case, the world, and bring her back to the Father's house. And uh, we noted this morning that really um, many of the things that we think we know about the Father from the Old Testament are really not about the Father as much as they are about Jesus Christ because, as Jesus reminded us in John 1.18, no one has seen the Father at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has revealed Him. Jesus was, in essence, telling us that all those things we see in the Old Testament where the Lord comes down and He interacts with His people or does various things were really the Son doing those things. Again, the Father breaks in, as it were, to human history as He makes comments about His Son, but we don't really learn very much about the Father through that either, except that He loves the Son and that we should listen to Him. So how do we learn about the Father? What is it that he was like? Well, we learn about that through Jesus because Jesus came to reveal the Father. He said in in that first part of this text, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. If you know me, you've known the Father. When Philip asked him, show us the Father and it's enough for us, he says, how long have I been with you, Philip, and still you don't know me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So what is the Father like? How would the Father receive them in heaven? Would He love them like Jesus loved them? Jesus says, yes, His Father was just like Him, that He had come to reveal His love for them. So in the love Jesus was showing to them, they were actually seeing the Father's love for them. Far from being someone that Jesus has to hold back because He's full of wrath, uh, the Father loves us in the same way that Jesus loves us. They had nothing to fear from Him but every reason to look forward to actually being with Him in heaven. Now, Jesus further encourages them by revealing what provision He had made for them uh, once He was gone. They must have been wondering about, with Jesus leaving, how is this work that they've been doing going to move forward? And how could they do it without Him? 
what was it that they could expect? And I'm sure, you know, if they were like the rest of us, we usually tend toward pessimism rather than optimism. And they were probably thinking it's all going to fall apart now because Jesus is leaving. Well, Jesus tells them something that perhaps they weren't really ready to believe, even though He had been giving them glimpses throughout His ministry, that when He left, things were not going to get worse, but things were actually going to get better. Not only would they be able to do what He had done while He was with them, but they were going to do greater things because He was going to the Father. So let's consider two things this evening. Let's consider the promise to His disciples and, in essence, to us that they would do greater things. And then let's look secondly at what Jesus said they had to do in order to receive these blessings. First of all, He says the apostles would do greater things. Jesus tells us again in verse 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in Me the works that I do, He will do also. And greater works than these He will do because I go to the Father. I do want you to notice that Jesus begins with um, something that I think we see more in the Gospel of John than in the other Gospels, and that is that double use of the word truly. Truly, truly, I say to you, or amen, amen, I say to you. He says that when He wants them really to focus upon what are you saying? Now, everything Jesus says, of course, is important, but when He really wants to draw their attention to something specifically, He uses that word twice. Now, what He wants them to see is this, that even though He would be gone, they would continue to do the work that Jesus had begun in the way that He was doing it. Now, what is it that Jesus was doing? Well, Jesus was doing things that we don't see today, but things they had seen Him doing and things that they had even experienced themselves doing. He was healing the sick, casting out demons, opening the eyes of the blind and the ears of the deaf, raising the dead, and preaching the gospel so that He might raise people spiritually. Jesus is saying, you are going to continue to do the same. Now, that particular thing should not have been a surprise to them since Jesus had commissioned them earlier on more than one occasion to go out and to do these very things, to teach and to preach and to perform miracles in the towns and villages of Palestine. Um, basically what Jesus is saying is what they had done while He was on earth, even though He was going to heaven, they would continue to do those same things. But it wouldn't be just these sort of one-time commissions that began and ended, but from that point forward. Now, he says not only would that be true of them, but also true of everyone who believes in him. So there is a sense in which this promise applies also to us because we fall in that category of those who believe in Christ. But we do have to make or recognize some differences uh, that exist between their time and our time. I would say by far the most important um, uh, things that Jesus was basically promising to them still apply. But Jesus says there was more. Not only would they do the things that He had done, even though He was going to be in heaven, they would do greater things. Now, this is interesting because I think here there is a question as to what Jesus actually meant by greater. He could have meant that they would uh, well, that they would do uh, more of the things that um, uh, Jesus had been doing on earth because the word here, greater, can simply mean more in number. There would be more of them. There would be a, a longer period of time and greater opportunity. Perhaps there would simply be greater number, a greater number of these works. But another thing He could have meant was that they would do things that would be even more extraordinary than what He had done. And we see that that certainly is what happened. You recall that um, among the miracles that Jesus did, uh, there was a woman who had a hemorrhage for, for many years. She'd been bleeding and she couldn't stop and so she was sick and weak and unclean. Nobody would could touch her. 
Well, when she saw Jesus, she went through the crowd and reached out and touched just the fringe of his cloak, and she was healed. That was a great miracle, a great act of faith by this woman to believe that Jesus could heal her if, if she just simply touched the fringe of his garment. But we read in the book of Acts that there were many more who were healed when Peter's shadow fell on them. Luke writes in Acts 15, excuse me, Acts chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, and all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women, were constantly added to their number to such an extent that they even carried the sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. Also, the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. Well, Jesus' garment, as it were, <laughs> uh, healed this woman, although it wasn't his garment, it was the woman's faith. In this case, it was Peter's shadow, but again, it wasn't Peter's shadow. It was basically the faith that these people had in that the Lord was working through Peter and that even if his shadow touched them, they would be healed. We also read, uh, or Luke writes a little bit later in the book of Acts, chapter 19, verses 11 and 12, how there were people who were being healed by articles of clothing that belonged to Paul. He says, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out. These, I would submit, were greater miracles, greater works. Now, we know that when Jesus was preaching, there were some that were converted. But you know, it, it's, one thing that's interesting is you have the Son of God in human flesh, the perfect preacher who is able to accommodate his message perfectly to those who are actually already God's people, and yet he seems to have had the fewest number of converts among those who were preaching. Again, that had to do with God's will. Uh, we see that when Pilate offered to release Jesus, that virtually nobody in the crowd spoke up on his behalf, either because there weren't very many people there who belonged to him, or maybe there were none, or the ones that did belong to him were few and they were afraid to speak. We see that when Jesus left for heaven and he told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father, that those who were gathered together to pray in the upper room were only about 120. Those were the people who belonged to the Lord Jesus who were in the area, who were waiting as Jesus commanded, praying for that promise that Jesus said he was going to send from the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit. So at the end of Jesus' ministry, we see 120 that are in the upper room praying for that miracle. But after Jesus ascends to heaven and goes to the Father, what do we see? We see when Peter preached at Pentecost, there were 3,000 that were converted by that one sermon. We see that when he and John went to the temple in order to pray and they saw the lame man, they healed the lame man, and it gathered this crowd together and Peter preached and another 5,000 were converted. Many of the people who were converted very early on here were uh, were actually used by the Lord to go back to their hometowns because remember at Pentecost it gathered people from all over the Roman Empire. And those who were converted went to where they lived and planted new churches. We actually see that or saw that happen in Rome. Now again, this appears to be something greater. The disciples seemed to experience greater deliverances uh, from the hand of God. Peter was released by an angel when he was put in prison. Uh, Paul and Silas uh, could have walked free when the earthquake caused their chains to fall off and the door opened when they were in Philippi. Uh, Paul was stoned to death by an angry mob for preaching the gospel, but the Lord raised him back to life. Again, I would submit that these were greater things. But again, why is it that there would be these greater things that the Lord had promised? What, what is it that changed? Well, it was the fact that Jesus had gone to heaven. Jesus had gone to the Father. Notice that if Jesus had remained with them, that wouldn't have happened. But if He left, if He went to the Father, 
then these things would take place. And again, think about the comfort that would bring. Far from being despondent that Jesus was leaving, they should be encouraged because His leaving was actually going to bring to them greater blessings, basically in the person of the Holy Spirit, who was going to give them the ability to do greater miracles and who was going to bring about greater power in their preaching, greater strength, greater energy, and more conversions. Now, one thing I think we should ask ourselves regarding this, because Jesus said this would be true not only for the disciples, but for everyone who believes in Him. Has the day of greater things ended? Was this something Jesus meant just for the disciples, or is it something that applies to us? Now, again, I told you before, we do have to recognize that there is a sense in which some of these things were only for them, particularly in the Miracle department, although I, I do believe God still does miracles today, I think we have to recognize that not only from what we read in the Bible, but from history, that the time of charismatic gifts has come to an end. I mean, we see them trail off in Scripture. We know from church history that those who knew the apostles knew that that was a time of miracles, how God was confirming His Word through them, but when the apostles died off and the Word of God was complete... Uh, those abilities to do those particular miracles basically ceased. Now, we do believe the Lord still gives gifts for service, but He doesn't give these miraculous gifts. He still does miracles, but He doesn't necessarily give anyone the ability to do them at will. There was a reason why God gave those miracles, and that was to confirm the word he was giving through his messengers so that those who heard them would know that this was the word of God. But as I said before, there is still encouragement for us because there is one thing that the Lord still does that is his greatest work, and that is the work of conversion. What about that work that the Lord has done, the resurrection of a, of a soul from spiritual death to spiritual life? Well, the Lord still grants that new birth. The fact that we're here actually proves it. The reason why we love the Lord Jesus is because He has basically uh, interfered in a good way in our lives to bring about that change so that we might love Him, that we might serve Him. God still grants the new birth. Well, what about the large numbers of people that we see converted in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost and in subsequent times? Uh, does God still do greater works like that? Well, you know, you just need to read the history of revival uh, to see that the Lord has done even greater things than He did on the day of Pentecost. He doesn't always do it. It's not always the time of revival. God isn't always saving huge numbers of people. Most of the time He doesn't, but at least in such large numbers. But He still does save people, and there are times when he does do these greater things and sends revival because he has gone to the Father. But now the second thing is, what did Jesus tell his disciples that they would have to do in order to gain these blessings? They weren't going to come automatically. Well, Jesus said he would grant them in answer to prayer. He continues in verses 13 and 14. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now, you can see how, how this particular verse or these verses could be misunderstood and have been misunderstood, so we do want to understand what Jesus is saying and what He is not saying here. Now, if they wanted these things... If they wanted power to heal the sick, to cast out demons, if they wanted strength and courage to preach the gospel, if they wanted to see people converted, what they had to do was ask. Now, the word here means a bit more than just simply making a request, you know, Father, would you please do this? Lord, would you please do this? Uh, the word means to request with urgency. Now, here's one place perhaps where you know, being able to access the Greek, you might see a little bit more meaning here than is in the English word because there are different ways in which you can ask.
But basically what Jesus is saying is that you need to ask with a kind of urgency almost to the point of demanding, although we know that we cannot demand anything from God, there is this kind of, um, you might say, tenacity, as Jesus said on one occasion, importunity, that we need to ask and keep on asking. If we would receive the things that Jesus wants us to do, we must really want them. We can't just lift up prayers that are just barely above the level of indifference. We have to seek Him with urgency. Secondly, He said they had to ask in His name. Now, they couldn't come in their own name. We can't come in our own name. There's no reason why the Father or Jesus should listen to us or to them because we don't deserve it. The only one who does is Jesus, which is why we need to come in His name. We need to base all of our requests on His merits on His access to the Father, on the grounds that He deserves these things, not us. So His worthiness and not our worthiness. Um, Also, I believe that that this shades into the next point because if we're going to ask something in the name of Jesus, we do need to ask for something that we believe Jesus would want us to have, right? And not just for something we might want, as James says, to spend upon our own lusts. It has to be something that we know Jesus wants us to have. And I think the third point basically points in that same direction because what they asked for had to be something that would glorify Jesus and His Father. Their requests could not be self-centered. You know, just kind of putting ourselves back in their time frame. Lord, make me rich. You know, I want to be as rich as Solomon. Or, Lord, I'd like to have a condo by the Sea of Galilee, you know. Or, I want to be the greatest evangelist that's ever lived. You know, I want people to look at me and know who I am when I pass by. Well, those are the things the Pharisees would be after, not those that follow the Lord Jesus. Their requests had to be God-centered and God-honoring, things that He wanted, things that were according to His will, things that would bring glory to His name things that, again, Jesus would, would want for them to have. Now, if they asked for these things, which they would ask for these things because, uh, as we saw this morning, um, by God's grace, by His Holy Spirit, they were being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, then Jesus says that He Himself would answer their prayers. He says in verse 14, If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. It's not just the Father who's answering our prayers, it's Jesus. Because Jesus, as we also saw this morning, is fully God. He is God in our nature, but He's still fully God. He possesses the whole of the divine being. He has all of the attributes of God. He has the power to answer our prayers. And He says that if we ask Him for these things in His name that He will do it. He not only hears our prayers, but He has the power to answer these prayers, and He will answer our prayers, He says, if we come in the right way. So now, fast-forwarding to the present, here we are, disciples of Christ, we believe in Him. What are we going to do in order to get the resources that we need to do what the Lord has called us to do? In reaching this world, which is becoming increasingly dark, with the light of the gospel. Where are we going to find the resources? Where are we going to find the energy? Where are we going to find the courage? How can we expect anyone to be converted through our efforts? Well, Jesus said that we would do greater things. Everyone who believes in Him would not only do what He did, but will do greater things Because He goes to the Father, because He has sent His Spirit into the world. Uh, Jesus is going to later tell His disciples, He's going to give them another comforter who would be with them, who would lead them into the truth, who would empower them, who would convict the world. All of these things that He was telling His disciples are still true today. Now, it's also true there's going to be times when the Lord is going to give more 
of His Spirit. He's going to give more of this help, and there's going to be times when He gives less. We know that from the history of the church. We know that from what we see in the Scripture. We know that from the history of revival. It isn't always time for revival. But we also know this, that the work is going to continue and move forward all the time. And when the Lord wills, He will push it forward even more powerfully from heaven than He did while He was on earth because now He reigns in heaven. Now He has that authority to do all His holy will. So all we need to do in order to appropriate this power is to pray, to pray with urgency, to pray, as it were, again, with this kind of um, tenacity that we're not going to let go. We're going to take hold of Him by faith until we see Him answer our prayers. We need to pray with His glory in mind, not our own glory. Now, again, the Lord has already given us the heart that we need to be able to pray in this way. The Lord has already given to us His Holy Spirit if we, tr if we have trusted Him. Now, as we also saw this morning, we still have a struggle going on within us. We still have that sin nature. We still may desire to be rich and famous, uh, but knowing that the Lord doesn't necessarily want us to be rich and famous, and in more cases than not, He doesn't want us to be rich and famous, we will be willing to set those things aside and ask for what we know the Lord wants us to have, the things that will honor Him, the things that will advance His kingdom. We can know that when we pray for these things because we really want them and because we really want the Lord to be glorified, when we ask for these things in His name on the grounds of His merits, Jesus will not only hear us, but He will do whatever we ask because in answering our prayer, He will be bringing glory to the Father. He will be accomplishing His Father's will because those are the things we're going to be asking for. So in closing, let me just challenge each of us to examine our own prayer life and to think about what it is we're asking for. Are the things that we're praying, are they centered upon ourselves? on the things that we want, when we ask the Lord even to do good things, uh, things perhaps that He would want to, uh, to answer, things that He would want to hear, are we asking with the right motives? Are we asking because we know these things will bring glory and honor to Him, or are we simply asking these things because those, these are things we want to see happen? Well, if if our prayers do center upon ourselves, we need a, basically a reorientation in our prayer life. We need to focus on, uh, on the Lord's glory. Because remember what Jesus says here. He says that He will do what we ask so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. That has to be the motive. That has to be the goal. We need to begin seeking after what it is that the Lord wants now again, there's nothing wrong with asking for the things we need. There's nothing wrong for asking for the things even that we want as long as the reason we want them is so that we might better serve the Lord. Remember what Paul said to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So everything that we do should be for His glory. Everything that we want then should be that we might better do what we do for His glory. His glory needs to be first and foremost so that we might serve Him. If we want things for any other reason, we really need to understand that we're asking outside of the will of God. So may the Lord give to us more of His Holy Spirit, to work more the image of His Son within us that we might have more of His heart and more of His mind so that when we ask for more of what it is He wants, we might begin to see more answers to prayer. Remember, the reason why we don't see answers to prayer is not always because we have the wrong motives, but oftentimes it is, isn't it? Because we want them. You know, we ask and we don't receive, James says, because we ask amiss 
because we want to spend it upon our own lust. But Jesus tells us here, if we ask because we want to glorify the Father, He will hear us and He will do it. So if we want to see more answers to prayer, we need to put this focus into our prayers. We need to seek for His glory. We need to seek for His honor. We need to ask for the things that we know Jesus wants us to have, and we need to desire them strongly. If we do, Jesus says He will do it, and that is a tremendous blessing. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to, to help us apply this, appropriate this, and, and practice this in our lives.